Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. How are you, Bert? Great. How are you today, Peter? Good, thanks. Uh, looking forward to the show. We've got one of the characters of a rude riddle here, Dr. Heath Sonye. Heath Sonye, uh, when, he, when he came, actually when he came, it was a funny story. I, I didn't know how to pronounce his name. And he goes, it's, it's Sonye, just like Kanye. Oh. There you go. He's going to be calling himself Ye now? <laughs> I don't know. No, he doesn't call himself that. He doesn't call him that. But he is a, he is a character, a uh, lot of fun. He brings a lot of life to the, to the practice. He's a good practitioner. Does a good job and um, has a unique practice here with us. So we'll, we'll talk about that with him today. Yeah, and I don't think there's anybody that's really going to outwork the guy. I mean, his client no. base loves him, and he yep. is just um, he's just out there working and doing things. And he brings, as you say, some interesting things to practice. I mean, he's developed a, a talent for complementary therapies, and so I'm looking forward to him expanding upon those. Yep, he does. And so it's, he's, he's brought that to the practice and enhanced it. Yeah, so uh, stall side this week, we're talking to Dr. Heath Sonia, and he is going to tell us all about his career and his current practice focus. <laughs> Heath, welcome to stall side. <laughs> hey man, how's it going? I appreciate you guys having me today. Yeah, it's great to have you here. We're looking forward to the show. Yeah, I'm just glad to get some time to fit it in before it gets crazy. Yeah, okay, so we'll all talk quickly, which isn't a problem for me. Heath, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, so... Um, my name's Heath Sonye. I'm a shareholder here at Rudin Riddle, uh, just about a year doing that. So, uh, But I've been here for 10 years now, uh, and so uh, it's been wonderful. I'm originally from Louisiana. I uh, grew up, raised, born and raised there. Went to vet school at St. George's University in the Caribbean. I did my clinics at LSU. Came here for an internship and uh, never left. So here we are. So th- give, give us a brief overview of what it was like to be at St. George's. Do you like oh, snorkel for your food every day? No, you didn't have to snorkel for your food. They actually had, you know, people to feed you and whatnot. What have you. So it was, that was great. Uh, I loved my experience down there. Yeah. You know, being from small town Louisiana, I went to Louisiana Tech for, for uh, undergrad. And that's where I did my undergraduate at. And so going to t- really a third world country, it was very eye opening. Um, you know, you can you realize that how you never realize how good you got it until you don't have it. And so, and to see a lot of people there that still, you know, struggle even today, you know, not even having running water in their homes and stuff. So it's it really puts a lot of things in perspective for you. Um, and then being on the Island with a lot of people, you know, from around the world that were in my class, I mean, literally around the world and, and all over the United States and Canada and, and you get that melting pot of, of people kind of like it is here in Lexington, you know, you get a big melting pot of people. So I think that's why I'm able to get along with so many different personalities and really accept people for who they are, you know, and their beliefs and things. So it's, you know, really this little country boy from middle of nowhere, Louisiana, really opened my eyes a lot. So it was a, a great experience. You know, I always joke, you know, I left the island with an education, a wife and three dogs. So, you know, we're <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. yeah. yeah. So uh, what got you on the pathway to being a veterinarian? Oh, so I grew up on a farm. You know, we had, uh, when I was a kid, we had goats. And then as we grew up, we got cows and horses. And my dad works in the, uh, worked in the oil field for all growing up. So, you know, uh, when he was at work and me and my brother were in charge of taking care of the farm. So I loved every aspect of, you know, feeding the cows and then going through all the, the cows that have dystocias and helping fix some of that. My grandfather always had cows and farm cotton for over 30 years. So grew up a farm boy and always, you know, having a, just having that pull, that draw to, to working and helping with animals. So, you still an LSU Tigers fan? Go Tigers. It's been a little painful for you for the last few years, hasn't it? Yeah, it was, you know, the 2019 championship kind of, yeah. it's, it's okay. We can, the greatest team I ever, you know, you yeah. can go with a couple of rough years after okay. that, so it's okay. Right. Well, when you're at the top, there's only one way to go, and that's, that's right. down, that's right? right? So you can just say you saw the view from the top of the mountain, it was good, but you're just bumping down the side now. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Hitting every rock face on the way down. But it's okay, we're on our way back up. We got, uh, you know, got a new coach, and he seems yep. to be putting together a great staff. They got a good recruiting class yeah. this year, so, you know, uh, I look forward to be getting right back up there pretty yeah. quick so Heath what brought you to Root and Riddle and what does your practice look like well you know it's funny and when I was in vet school I didn't uh even growing up I never knew anything about Root and Riddle right you know from Louisiana well I, the clinic I worked at back home I started there when I was a senior in high school actually a junior in high school and I worked there all through the summer between junior senior high school and then all the weekends until baseball season started my senior year and then, uh, but that summer after I graduated, I started working there again and um, mostly just clean kennels and clean stalls. But, you know, I wanted to work at a practice to see if that was something I was going to 
enjoy if mm-hmm. this is something I wanted my life to go and do. And um, so I ended up working there for 10 years total, you know, for all through undergrad and even the summers when I was home from vet school. And then, uh, and I loved it. I mean, there was a mixed animal practice, did a ton of small animal, but the vet I worked for, Dr. Clark Cooper, I'm going to give him a shameless plug there. He uh, is great. He was a great mentor, and he did everything he could to get me to come back home. So if he's listening to this, sorry, Doc, but uh, Kentucky's home now. Uh, and uh, Because he had worked here uh, during when it, his early career. He had worked in Kentucky and stuff. So, um, But, uh, you know, again, in vet school, I didn't I have a friend of mine who was like, hey, I'm going to think about going. This is during uh, the summer of my third year. And uh, he's like, I'm thinking about going up to Kentucky to check out Rudin Riddle. I said, what is that? He's like, man, it's like the greatest equine hospital ever. I said, okay, well, it's, it's worth checking out. I've never been up there before. So I uh, emailed Starley, and she let me come up, and, and uh, I was here for a week, and mostly spent time in the hospital, and it's just I was just in awe of the, of the efficiency of how it was run, you know, and just the number of horses that come in, and, and then the number of people, and how it just all ran like a oil machine, and, and, and then the atmosphere just felt like family. And so um, I made it a point to come during my fourth year, and uh, so I came back during my fourth year for an externship, and, uh, you know, I really wasn't even going to apply for the internship. Um, and, uh, I just like, you know, just a little country boy from Louisiana. There's no way they'd, you know, they'd pick me. Right. And just an island student. Right. And, um, so at my wife's begrudgment, she's like, well, if you don't at least try, you'll always regret not trying at least uh, regret not applying. It's fair. So I applied and then, uh, Dr. Cook called me a couple weeks later. So, and offered me the internship. And then I started early and, uh, and loved every minute of it. And again, you know, I approached it as, I'm going to be here for a year. I want to see every case I can see, see as much as I can do, take it all in. You know, I still had at that point had every intention of going back home and, and working there, but I wanted to pull from the experiences and, and the knowledge here and see if I can take it home with me and take it well. So I wanted to do everything well. That work ethic turned into uh, doing the Stone Street resident residency. So I was a resident vet for Stone Street Farm, and that was just supposed to be for a one-year position. That turned into three. And uh, I loved every minute of that. That was great. Uh, you know, I got to full a lot of really high class mirrors and and to get a lot of experience from that. But then at that point, I started building a practice too. You know, so during the day, I could go out and call everybody. Hey, what do you got going on? And just follow around, and try to again. Just I didn't know if it was going to have another year attached to it, right? So it was just learn everything you can and take it with you, build a resume, and uh, you know that way. If if I you know wasn't a spot for me here, if it didn't work out, I'd at least have you know, a lot of experience to take with me wherever that went. And then, uh, you know, just kind of graduated and here we are, you know, 10 years later. So, mm-hmm. and now I'm a shareholder here. So, which is pretty amazing. I feel very, very honored to be able to have had that opportunity to do that. i uh, definitely worked very hard for it. And, um, so it's been great. And then, uh, you know, I really appreciate the things that Dr. Rude and Dr. Riddle and Dr. Pierce, um, you know, originally all started to build this for us here and to be able to have an opportunity to work here and continue that legacy is pretty amazing. Yeah, well, we're really gra- glad you're on board. Uh, you bring a uh, unique perspective. You're always happy, and I, um, you know, I don't think anybody would ever outwork you. You're just like shoulder to the wheel. Yeah, and, and a source of constant entertainment. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, you know, there's, there's a new can. dent in that car every time he pulls no, in the I, garage. I have a new car now, so it's kind <laughs> of know, yeah. I mean, careful. That, new car, <laughs> undiscovered territory. Yeah. Yeah. Who's right. going to get the first dent? Uh, me or Bart? Oh, I don't know. A new car too. Yeah. Oh, he a new truck. He's got that. He had yeah, that truck for a couple yeah years. but I've had it for a couple of years. There's no dents in it. That, but yeah. the last one oh. I had had 250,000 miles on yeah. it. And it didn't have any dents. Well, the on last it one I had had 300,000 miles on it. Some, had somebody, lots of dents in it. somebody, somebody <laughs> needs to touch some wood right now because <laughs> yeah. this, it, it, this it, is not going to go well. Statistically speaking, it would probably be me. Uh, but you know, I'll be constant. It's not my fault. When, what you, you know. need to do is <laughs> stop off at Home Depot on the way out there. Get a hammer. Just put a little ding in it. Somewhere so you said you can't see. Well, so see, so it, put it, the first one. The in. car is actually new to me. It was my wife's car, so now and now it's mine. So yeah, but uh, she loved it, man. She looked after it. She loved it. Not. I mean, it didn't have a lot of uh, road miles. It was mostly highway miles. So, uh, okay. Yeah, she's a small animal veterinarian. Uh, so. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. So she uh, she's the chief of of uh, ho- uh, she's chief of staff of a Banfield Pet Hospital in Louisville. Okay. And so she's uh she's the uh, the boss. Yep. Well, as long as you <laughs> as long as you remember that in all oh, of your sure. interactions, always. So, what does a day look like for Heath? 
Oh, so it really depends on time of the year. So, you know, now we're cruising into starting to get into the breeding season uh, and uh, the foals are already coming. I've got several on the ground and several more to still to come. Um, but typical day, start out early. I leave my house early in the morning. Uh, just a couple of farms close to my house. Uh, I'll do those early and then I'll go back to home. I pick up my five-year-old. I have two girls, uh, Lucy and Alice, and they're five and three. So my oldest one goes to school, so I take her to school. And then I swing by and pick up my tech either from the clinic or I have her meet me uh, closer to my house and then off to the races we go and go to mm-hmm. several farms. We'll check mares and get those ready, new foals, do those guys. And then uh, during the season, I pick two days during the week, usually Tuesdays and Thursdays, and uh, I'll do what I call my extra stuff. So uh, I do a fair amount of dentistry, not advanced dentistry, just mostly just you know, floating teeth, pulling wolf teeth, you know, the kind of normal things. And mm-hmm. then uh, uh, and then I also do certified chiropractics or veterinary spinal manipulative therapy. And I'm also just recently, I say recently, I've been – six months now but it's uh it's certified in veterinary medical acupuncture so uh, i've been incorporating those into my practice and into our practices as general you know we only had a, one other person that was only doing chiropractic we've got several people that do the acupuncture but nobody does both mm-hmm. so i figured i'd be the first to do both and uh and it's been a really great practice builder for me I mean, i've done i do a lot of work in in those and starting to get into start out mostly just doing some sport horses and i've slowly been getting integrated into doing some uh two-year-old horses and training uh, thoroughbreds are in training so i do some uh, a couple of barns for people and then uh, also in the sales horses so i did a few this year and hopefully that'll continue to grow a little bit and do a lot more of those guys and mostly wanted something to kind of feel my fall you know mm-hmm. I, I other than hunting deer and and uh, working on my farm i needed something else to make a little bit of income my wife told me i was spending too much money so i gotta start making some money and um <laughs> so you know the you know, majority of it comes from the spring when we're real busy so uh, i needed something else to, to do and, and you know i felt like it was something that we needed here in the practice that we didn't really offer you know uh we had some but not a lot and i wanted to you know, I felt like that's an area I can expand upon, so it was great. And in, in integrating that into my daily practice has been great, you know, uh, especially with the spinal manipulative therapy. It's a lot of neurologic stuff, so mm-hmm. it's all about the brain, cortex of the brain, how things, sensory input, how it comes in. So it's it's been neat since I've learned that to understand. I look at things a little differently. It's a little bit different way of thinking. You know, still Western medicine, but your overall physical exam approach is just a little different sometimes versus, you know, you kind of take it all in, look back and really look at other little areas. You know, I've had some other cases, you know, can't find out where it's lame and and it have a, you know, a chiropractic issue or something I'm able to, you know, fix there. So it's been really neat to be able to treat things a little differently and, uh, and see them do well. So yeah. let me, let me, why don't you speak to the, the skeptic for just a minute sure. <clears throat> who says, who says these are 1200 pound animals. Do you really think that you are going to manipulate their spine in a way that's beneficial to those horses? Yes. Carry on. I mean, just, <laughs> yeah. just uh, l- l- let me hear that because that's, uh, that is, you know, a, oh, lot, no, a, lot, sure. of, a lot of people yeah. say that. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and I wrote, and for people that are listening to the podcast, if they want to read and reference, I wrote an article for the uh, Pollock Report a couple years ago uh, about uh, spinal manipulative therapy. So it's a little bit more in, in depth, of, you know, uh, area there. And I do some talks as well. I did one at the, for our root and riddle. Um, client ed seminar we had in spring so uh, there's some some things that I've put out there but when you're dealing with those horses and again you know everybody thinks that yes, I think a, mo- a common misconception is that if we're moving bones and what we're actually doing is gapping joints um, is the biggest thing you're sending sensory input to the cortex to the brain so but you're able to manipulate a lot of the, the joints on the along the spinal column um, especially throughout the cervical vertebrae and even the thoracic vertebrae. And we use a little bit of leverage. So on the, like for the thoracic vertebrae, we use the dorsal spinous processes. You know, those guys can be really long, and especially on those ribs between three to eight and nine, those, those dorsal spinous processes are really long. So that's what we use to manipulate that. And a lot of it has to do with muscle and tendons as well. You know, a lot, uh, everybody wants to, I think another mis- uh, misconception is that people think that, like chiropractic or acupuncture are just regenerative therapies. They can also be prophylactic therapies as well. You know, if you got a horse that's not moving correctly and, you know, if it's not fluid in motion, we feel it ourselves too. You start walking one way, you get hurt, you start limping over a little bit. You're like you're not really lame, but you got some pain in your hip a little bit. And it's because you're overusing that. You know, the muscles on the other side aren't as strong as it. Horses get the same way. They just don't tell you that. And so what happens is they'll go and jump a big jump or they'll go out there and run around and they'll end up, pulling a tendon or hurting a muscle somewhere. And it's, some of that can be preventative if they weren't constantly putting that pressure on them one leg because they've already had a little inkling of pain. And uh, so it's able to find those little things that are able to help 
keep us going versus waiting until there's a catastrophic event or even, you know, something that's going to be able to prevent that. And able to, and so it comes with the training that I had to be able to understand the anatomy and feel and know how, which way those joints move. You know, you got the XYZ axis of the way the spinal column moves and each species is a little different, but horses, you know, don't really bend a whole lot axially through their pelvis, whereas dogs and cats can, they can twist and turn. Horses can't. So by taking that information in the way they are, you can manipulate those joints of the facets on those, each individual vertebra. So we're looking at it at a motion segment. So each, each little joint has moves a certain way and we're able to manipulate those joints. So we're, when we make an adjustment, so it's, um, it's a high velocity, low amplitude thrust putting in certain directions depending upon the movement of the joint or how the joint moves. So each joint is going to be manipulated a different way depending upon how that joint normally moves. Because uh, when you go to motion joints, say, say I'm motioning C4 in a neck, you should be able to feel that joint float or that vertebrae float in your hand. And a lot of times if you have a restriction there, you know, I don't like to say stuck or, you know, that's just not a great word. It's, it's more of a restriction. So there's, it's not moving like it should. I'm able to manipulate that using a, a thrust to release the synovial folds within that joint and gap that joint. And it allows a sensory release input to the brain. And that tells, you know, come back and tell the muscles and the tendons around it either to relax or tighten depending upon how they're, they're feeling at the moment. So most of the time, whenever I motion a joint, I make, a, make an adjustment. I'm able to come back and I can re-motion that joint and you can feel it move. It's that quick. It's that immediate. Some are going to be worse than others because of how long, if it's a chronic issue. When I mean, some horses are unable to to even take manipulation at some points because they're you know they're just that sore and they hurt. And so, yeah, again, this has been it's been great learning all this because I'm able to again look at things differently, look at how horses move. Uh, I had a case not recently ago, horses lame right front, and they were like, hey, you know, we can't figure out why I won't block to the foot. We blocked it all the way up the leg. Can't figure it out. I'm like, okay, well, let's have a look at it. I just watched the horse go one time, and and you touch this thing's back, and it just immediately explodes in the hind end, starts jumping up in the air. I'm like, okay, we have either this is a secondary or primary. I'm not really sure. So we treated the back, and uh, I did a few things with the acupuncture in the front front limb to increase some sensory input. I, I felt like I had a little uh, brachial plexus impingement or cervical nerve impingement that was causing an issue. And uh, two or three treatments later, and this horse is wide open, doing great. So, you know. Again, it's looking at it a little differently. What was the primary cause of the horse? Because it just fell down and hurt itself. Mm-hmm. We're not going to know. They're not going to be able to tell us. And, you know, so it's it's finding out those little things because they can't tell us where it hurts, which is a great book if you've never read that book. So I think you brought up something. The, another question that I had, you know, are most of your chiropractic problems, are they primary? The primary – you see these back sore horses. Are they primarily back sore or are they back sore because they've got another issue? Both. It can go both ways. Um, you know, to me, uh, you hardly ever see a primary back issue. And if you, in my experience, is, and if you do, it's usually due to trauma or saddle fit. Those are usually where you get primary back or you can have, um, kissing spines, but that's mm-hmm. technically not a primary change. It's usually due to the way the horse moves emotions, but that causes that over time to be able to, where they get that, that issue. Well, highland lameness, right? I mean, yeah. if they're not landing properly, the jarring, it's like stepping off the curb and absolutely not actually landing properly. Then you get a sore back the next day yeah. because, right? Yeah, so you, sure. can, you can see that. And, you know, it's, it's good to question those things because, oh, because it's different. But then again, it's like acupuncture, right? Well, for sure. you know, I'm, I'm a believer and a lot of people think, well, you know, you're just sticking needles in and a little bit of smoke and mirrors. But, but you're sticking needles in, in, a, in, in a spot in for a reason, specific right? Specific spots. And it's like herbal therapy as well, right? Well, where do most of your drugs come from anyway? Plants. <laughs> Is right, what, so just because, they all originated, just right? because somebody had a different sort of um, source of these medications mm-hmm. doesn't mean that they don't actually work, and it's just a case of you're like me. Some days you need a different toolkit, right? For sure, and yeah. it's just another tool to have in the kit, right? Yep. That I'm able to, you know, if I need to, I can pull it out and use it, which is great, and it's great to offer that for my clients and our clients as a practice. And, you know, and another thing I would say about the acupuncture is the course I took is more of a Western based course, so you, we use the Eastern mm-hmm. medicine or Chinese traditional medicine for the terminology. So it's not, uh, I don't use a ton of herbs and, and aquapuncture and things of that nature. It's more of a dry needling, but it's based off of neurology. It's based off science. Uh, and that's the reason why I really kind of got behind the chiropractic as well as the acupuncture because it's more science-based. Know your anatomy. 
And that was a that was a great thing going back and taking those courses. It really boosted. I loved anatomy and vet school, but uh, going back and taking those courses, they really drilled it in you to know it. Because if you don't, I mean, if you don't know where those nerve endings are coming into the spine, or you, it really helps you kind of localize the level of the lesion. That's the goal of it, right? Figure out where is actually is this hurting at, and then mm-hmm. what can I do to help it. Those are you know that's what our goal for everything, right? When we treat things, a lot of things. Where does it hurt, and how can what can I do to treat it? At that point, you know, be it distal limb or along the cervical spine or whichever. It could be a muscle. It could just be a little nerve issue. We get those things as humans. Mm-hmm. We just say, you know, my hip really hurts. And you go to the doctor and like, well, it's not nothing we can really do for you. Here's some anti-inflammatories, which is what most practitioners would do, right? Mm-hmm. And then you go to a chiropractor and I'm like, well, here, let me see if I can help you. And they'll adjust that. And then, wow, it feels a little better, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I've, I didn't, until I went and got uh, the certification i'd never been to a uh, chiropractor myself so i was like we well, you know if i'm gonna if i'm gonna do this i should check it out at the time i was having some neck issues when i was i couldn't turn my head at all uh and i think it's just from palvin mares all the time you kind of mm-hmm. getting stuck in that little bit of a position and uh right, whiplash know, from all those <laughs> car wrecks you're in there no whatever and uh so <laughs> hitting the curb <laughs> uh, but man it was it was truly eye-opening with I, after i got adjusted i was like wow i can actually my head's supposed to turn you know i can do that it's pretty amazing so uh and, and it's Sometimes it's immediate with those horses. When you make adjustments, they really show yep. you, uh, you know, thank you. <laughs> you know, they, they'll wear it because uh, I've got some horses where I've started on there. Yeah, just extremely painful when you start. And then uh, you make a couple adjustments. And I'm like, okay, I'll let you do a few things. And then when you come back to see them the next time, it's like, oh, I remember you. I'll stand here now. So you don't have to chase them around trying to do some adjustments. So it's, and say so I found the same thing with needle speed. I don't know if you had that same issue. You know, some of them you can – Put it every all the mm-hmm. news you can the first time. Some of them you're lucky if oh, you yeah. might get one. Yep. But usually once they kind of when they relax realize, into it, yeah, 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 yeah. And man, they really really enjoy it. So yeah. and, and it's a great and to me it, it works. And so that's why I'm able. That's why I, I use it. If it didn't work, I wouldn't use yeah. it. Same thing with you know you guys with medications and other people. If they don't work, we're not we're not gonna waste the time with it, right? Uh, or if it's something that we're doing, and it's not working. We're not gonna waste your time with it. So for me, it's. Uh, it's been really eye opening, and it's been great for my clients and and my patients. So, and I think that's the way to approach it too. In that we're like heavily Western trained, and yeah. you know, there's certain things that only Western medicine can do. But there's certainly chronic things where the complementary therapies are really help. And I approach the acupuncture as a skeptic. Yeah, right? same. And when same. I was doing the course, somebody pulled me aside and sort of said, "Isn't this really controversial? Somebody doing what you're doing down here doing this acupuncture course?" And that's what I said. Sometimes I just need a different toolkit because there's sure. chronic issues that Western medicine has no answer for. So you do your mil- manipulative therapy, you do your needles, you do your herbals. Because if I had like appendicitis, I'm going to go Western and get it taken out. If I have like <laughs> chronic arthritis or some other issue that is not responding to Western treatment, I'm going to try something complementary because it is just that. Correct. It is complementary. And you're right. You look at your patients differently. Everyone and then them. all of a sudden, it just becomes a whole lot more interesting. Correct. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no cookbook, right? Yep. Each patient is different. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to treat each patient differently. They all have, you know, you might get lucky and one of them have something that one had along the road and you're like, okay, I know how to treat that now. You know, it worked for that. But then again, that treatment may not work for that horse. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you kind of have to, and that's one thing I love about it. It's a little bit of a puzzle. Um, you know, putting these guys together. I'm not, I really don't like a lot of lameness. I'm not into doing pre-purchases and things. I, I did early in my career, but uh, I don't do that much anymore. And, uh, but I enjoy, and even now it's like, I know it's a true lameness issue that, you know, needs a joint blocked or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, th- go see Dr. Bram Lynch or Dr. Hopper or, yeah. <laughs> Doctor, or one of our sport horse vets. Uh, because what I'm doing for you may make you make the horse feel better now, but it's not going to mm-hmm. continue to do that. You know, mm-hmm. you have a real issue that we need to take care of first. But then it's, again, it's complimentary after they have that done because then we're able to keep it going longer because that horse is hurting there for a reason. Okay. Why was he originally, say you got bone bruising in a fetlock, right? Um, okay. Yes. Is it just due to training? Right. Is that why it's getting there? Okay, great. Well, these complementary therapies will help with some of the inflammation, but it's not going to fix what you have going on there. You know, you're either going to need to have a sculpt or, or you know, arthroscopy done or whatever done at that point. Into, but then you, as you come into rehab, these things will be helped because a horse can be off that limb. Everything else is going to be stiffened up because it hasn't been using like it is. So before we start training, hey, why don't we just wake everything up, wake the nervous system up, get everybody on the same page before we go back to training. And I think those horses will do better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you've obviously invested a lot of time in uh, these complementary um, aspects to your practice, and you're obviously very passionate about it. Would you recommend this investment in your time and your brain power to somebody else? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I've already actually have one of our other associates um, going this fall. So, oh, great. Uh, I, and my, 
my practice is starting to get a little bit busier. I had some other area um, people that were doing that that have turfed me clients because they're just so busy. Mm -hmm. And then I find myself getting a little bit busier with it as well. And I feel like it's a, it's really a high demand. Um, you know, a lot more people are wanting it, uh, you know, for their, for their horses. And, and I think it's going to be great. And it's, it's always good to have options for me, for my clients. Whenever I, you know, we're presented with an issue, I always like to say, okay, here's a couple of different options that we can go through and treat this horse with, you know, right? We can start out pretty conservative or we can go knock the ball out of the park and let's, let's go on and, and do whatever. But I always feel like it's important that you have options for your clients and not just one way of thinking. I mm -hmm. think it's always best to have, you know, cause again, like, like veterinarians, people are the same, right? They think differently. Some people believe in certain stuff. Some people don't. And, you know, and it's not my job to, I don't want to convince you into doing a therapy on your horse that you don't believe in. That's fine. But, but let me show you. And then, and then at that point, if it works great, if it don't, you know, no skin off my back, it's fine. Um, but I think it's important to have those options for clients to be able to use. And, you know, for our practice, I feel like it's, it's good for us to have these therapies and mm -hmm. to be able to offer them for our clients. Well, people look at what they desire themselves and they want that for their animals, right? Mm -hmm. Is that if it's good enough for me, it should be good enough for them. And ultimately we're all trying to do the best thing we can for by sure. whatever means for sure and you know like I say some of those cases it may work for it, and some of them it's like you know what yeah, i'm doing for you is not going to yep. not going to help you need you know yep. we need a surgeon involved for this or mm -hmm. you know what whichever you know if it's a or medicine or whatever it need be but you know it's definitely a good option to have or know the diagnostic tool as well but i, I think that people have had enough experience with it now that's becoming more widely accepted for sure you, mm -hmm. do you find that people trust you more now that you have the beard uh, of course, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know it's got a lot more gray in it now. Than what <laughs> that, it used that to. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's well, right. I always blame the beard on the horses and the hair, on, the hair on top of my head for the kids. So because uh, the beard started turning gray before the, the hair did. So I, I did have a client tell me once he wouldn't, he couldn't trust me because I have any gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> Still young, but they know. Yeah, now I got nothing, so I don't yeah. know. So do they trust you more or less uh, now? Uh, well, it's <laughs> it's, it's, well they me. can't tell. It's, it's, well under, founded. it's undeclared now. They can't tell. No, they yeah. give him another right. chance. <laughs> There's plenty but of gray. No, he don't have hair. It's There's okay. plenty of gray. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm not. I'm not to the point where I need to shave my hair, but uh, I definitely need a haircut. My wife told me I had to wear a hat today, so she, I, she's like, <laughs> you know, there's probably gonna have video there, right? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, yeah, you should wear a hat. Yeah. Well, you did say she was the boss, Heath. She is. Yeah. I just do what she tells me. And she's. Yeah. But she's doing a fine job. Absolutely. She's the best veterinarian i know yeah absolutely high praise so um what does the future hold for you uh, you know i want to continue um building this practice you know and, and maintaining it i feel like dr rudin and dr riddle set a, a wonderful foundation for us all here uh you know i would love to see and you know if i'm still practicing in 30 years and i always always joked you know in 30 years when i started i wanted to practice because i wanted to not because i had to mm -hmm. uh so that's still a goal right i still want to uh, practice because i want to not because i have to and uh you know i want to see this place grow. i want to see us to conv continue to develop young veterinarians and uh you know like you guys have been supportive of me doing the things that i wanted to to do and, and get good at and continue to support them in the whatever endeavor they are to help you know have those things for our clients to be able to, you know, offer them, you know, as long as we keep, you know, being innovative. And I think that's going to be wonderful for mm -hmm. our practice. I mean, that's, that's, to me, that's one thing that Rudin Riddle sought after for is innovation, new things that are coming in and how we're able to offer those things for our clients and be able to continue to offer excellent service and care. So have you worked out where you're going to put your Cajun-themed restaurant on campus here? Because I'm sure that's something <laughs> I'm you want to do. I'm looking forward to that, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it's funny. I made a gumbo this past weekend. It's quite wonderful. But uh, when, when Scott Alshweed left and, you know, the, the barbecue the yeah. barbecue kind of went with him, I was, I was hoping <laughs> somebody else. I'm up for Cajun. That would be good. Yeah, you know, I'll try not to make it too spicy for you Yankees, but, you know, I'll be the best <laughs> I can take it. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm considered a Yankee in my own state, you know. Yeah, because right. yeah, right. I'm yeah. from North Louisiana. So I mean, if you live above I-10 in Louisiana, you're considered a Yankee. So. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's, when you're, it's bad when you so consider you're Yankee in your own state. People, you're people a man without a country. <laughs> well, I, you know, I've been home in 10 years, so they really think I'm a Yankee now. It's okay. People have just got to let this go. <laughs> <laughs> they just got to let it go. Well, you know, it's, it's a different, you know, I always tell people too, like, it's di food in New Orleans is different from food in Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. You know, in New Orleans, you get more of the Creole spice, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. whereas in Baton Rouge, it's more of the Cajun spice. And I'm more of the Cajun guy. I like the more of the Cajun spice versus the Creole spice. So you are the raging Cajun. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Absolutely. You know, support my Tigers and the you know, baseball season's coming up soon and uh, we'll be good.
Yep, that's right. Self-anointed, self-appointed, resident, raging Cajun. There you go. That's going to take a lot to fit on your license plate. <laughs> that, that, I've tried. The bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> bumper sticker. That's excellent. Well, um, Heath, it's been delightful to have you here. It's really good to hear about your practice and, and what you're getting Thanks, up guys. to. Yeah. yeah, and that's really interesting stuff on your manipulative therapy and acupuncture and how you're tying that all together. Would you recommend anybody out there listening to be a veterinarian? Absolutely. It's a, it's a wonderful profession. You know, with all professions, it has its downfalls. Everything does. But it's, you know, I always said I wanted to do something whenever I wake up in the morning, I'm excited about going to work. And I'm excited about going to work. I think it's important that you surround yourself with good people and, and a good practice who support you, you know, every day. Um, and veterinary medicine is, is spectacular. It's challenging. And, uh, you know, your patients can't talk to you, so you have to figure it out. And, that, and that's part of the challenge. Um, you know, it, it was funny because I had a student one time, you know, I, I wanted to do veterinary medicine because I don't want to have to deal with people. I'm like, well, sorry, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty much all the job yep. is dealing with people, right? So, you know, you got to take it with, uh, you know, with a grain of salt when you're coming into it because you're going to have to deal with people and some good, some bad, but that's every profession that's out there. You know, there's good and bad with everything. But, you know, if you're always looking for the good and try to be positive, uh, you know, me, I try to stay positive every day. And uh, because I think that makes you, hey, it makes you a better practitioner when you're always positive. You know, I try not to paint, you know, pump sunshine and rainbows or try to be real with things. But, you know, if you're positive in, in your everyday life with everything that you do, you know, life is good. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the little things, you just kind of don't sweat those guys and, and push on. So so the young vet out there, you can do it. If I can do it, you can definitely do it. Okay. All right. I feel, Thank you. I feel inspired. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Excellent. You so that was inspired, actually. <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, know, we talked about those troughs and valleys earlier. Yeah. Big Dr. Morsi, I'm pretty sure you're more on the... On well, the I sort of <laughs> think, yeah, that's all of a sudden. I think I've turned around and climbing back up the hill right now. Perfect. Come on. We'll climb together. <laughs> yeah, there you go with all my bruises and cuts. <laughs> well, that was stall side for this week. We've been talking to Dr. Heath Sonia um, at Rood and Riddle. Um, really a motivated and interesting character. See you next time. Um,